Today, we're taking a flight on board the oldest aircraft type in the United Airlines fleet, the Boeing 767-300ER. Despite their age, these aircraft continue to operate a significant number of long-haul flights to Europe and South America. But we're not going to either of those places today, instead taking a short 90-minute domestic flight from Houston to Orlando. However, as an added bonus, this flight will be spent in the front of the 767 in Polaris Business Class, providing a unique contrast between the new and the old. Good morning from Houston Intercontinental's Terminal B, where after arriving from Dallas, I've got roughly two hours before my next flight to Orlando. Connections in Houston aren't too bad, but I would say definitely be ready to walk a good amount. That's because the terminals on the southern half of the airport are not connected by the Skyway train. The Skyway only runs in a straight line on the northern half of the airport, so anyone arriving at Terminal E in the southern halves of Terminals A, B, and C will have to walk to the north side to catch the Skyway. But that's not to say you can't walk between certain terminals. If I'm not mistaken, you can theoretically walk between all of the terminals except Terminal A. To get there, you would have to take the Skyway. My flight to Orlando will depart from Terminal E, but because I had some time before boarding, I'm doing something that I haven't done before. I'm taking this flight with my fellow Illini, that aviation geek, who had arrived in Houston before me. He has a membership with the United Club that also entitles him to bring two free guests. So here we are at one of the Terminal C United Clubs on his gracious invitation. This was my first time in a United Club, and I mean, it's nowhere near the Almorjan Lounge in Doha, but it was a nice place to relax a little bit. While there is plenty of nice seating, lounge areas, and workstations, the club was absolutely rammed, but I guess that's somewhat commonplace here in the States. And speaking of, I am flying first class today, but annoyingly enough, being booked in a premium cabin doesn't grant you lounge access in the States unless you have some sort of credit card or status on top of that. Unfortunately, as a result of the rush, the food options were quite limited and it understandably took some time to replenish the stock, but I was just happy to be here. And one really cool thing about United Clubs that I must add is that they offer free copies of the Hemispheres magazines that would otherwise be offered on board the plane, so of course I decided to take one. After some time in the United Club, we decided to make our way over to Terminal E using the Skyway. Now, yes, we could have walked, but where's the fun in that? This morning, we're on board United Flight 543 to Orlando, departing from Gate E5. Terminals D and E are where most international flights, especially long-haul intercontinental ones, depart from here in Houston. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of United's long-haul departures go from Terminal E, while Terminal D is the primary international terminal servicing most foreign carriers. As mentioned earlier, my gate today is E5, which is the same gate I arrived at two years earlier on the 777 from Chicago. And here she is, the 32-year-old 767-300ER taking us across to Florida today. It's been a long time since I last flew on a 767-300, 13 years. Back in 2011, I flew on the United 767-300 from Chicago to London Heathrow and then one week later from Paris back to Chicago. Those were the good old days back when the legendary blue tulip or rising blue livery was commonplace. I'm quite excited about this flight because it's pretty hard to find United 767s flying domestically these days, especially on the Dash 300. When I took this flight, United was flying the 763 on one daily round trip between Houston and Orlando through the end of March. Unfortunately, this has since ended and it looks to be all United 737s on this route. Boarding started on time, and because I'm in domestic first class, I'd be boarding in group 1, and yes, 
all of the people in the left line are group one as well. I guess I couldn't be too surprised because this flight was going out pretty full and we are on a 767 after all, so there are more premium seats to be sold as a result. The Boeing 767-300 is the oldest aircraft type in the United Fleet with an average age of 28 years old. Of the 37 767-300 ERs in active service with United, 20 of them are over 30 years old. So that begs the question, well, when will these dinosaurs be retired? At the moment, United is tentatively expecting to retire their 767-300s and 400s in 2030 as they start receiving new Airbus A350-900s and more Boeing 787s. I somehow never realized this earlier, but there are actually two different configurations across the United 767-300 fleet. The first subfleet, the 76L, is commonly referred to as the High J configuration, with J being the code name for business class. This is the more common configuration on the United 763s, with 24 examples having this layout. There are only 167 seats in this configuration, with 46 in business class, 22 in premium economy, 43 economy plus, and 56 standard economy seats. Now, there's also another less common configuration as well. The remaining 13 767-300s, like the one we're flying on today, have a higher density configuration and are designated as 76Q. These have 203 seats with 30 in business class, 24 in premium economy, 32 in economy plus, and 117 in economy. Now, the high J 767s primarily operate flights to Europe, such as London, Paris, etc. You can actually easily identify one of these aircraft because they only have one operational overwing exit door, which is really unique for a 767-300. Now, this is because of the very low number of seats, so only one overwing exit needs to be used, and therefore the other one is plugged. However, the 76Qs are higher density, and so they need both overwing exits to be operational. These planes are normally used on flights to South America, such as to Rio de Janeiro, Santiago, and Lima, in addition to flights to Munich, Germany, and occasionally Hawaii and San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'll be seated in 5A for this near two-hour flight. Now, while this is technically Polaris business class, United sells it as simply domestic first on domestic flights. Also, pro tip, the ideal choices for solo travelers are the odd-numbered window seats, as these are closer to the window and thus further from the aisle. No surprises here, the seats are really comfortable with large headrests and fantastic padding. On the seat back, you'll first find the large entertainment screen with a USB port and a small shelf underneath to store things like a passport, phone, or other small items. Below is the tray table that can easily be extended by a slight push. All the way at the bottom is a large footwell where you could store your bag or shoes in flight. Now when the seat goes fully flat, it does seem that there would be enough space for your feet as well. Depending on what side you're sitting on, there is a coat hook to either the right or the left of the entertainment screen, which I found helpful. The window side armrest features all of the seat controls and some others. There's a small storage cabinet that can be opened at the push of a button, and inside you'll find the headphones, a mirror, and more storage space. Below the cabinet are the IFE remote control, universal power outlet, and headphone jack. And then there's a shelf where you could put drinks, and in my case, my passport and the sanitizing wipes. Directly to your side is the armrest that houses the in-flight literature, and can also be raised or lowered by the push of a button. At the end of the seat, you'll find an adjustable reading light. Now, while the seat itself is somewhat new, some parts of the cabin haven't been touched since this plane entered service in 1992, such as the overhead panels, which you can see are super retro. Shortly after taking my seat, the crew came around distributing pre-departure beverages, which for me was water in a plastic cup. Also, as I looked around the seat, I noticed that the plane hadn't been thoroughly cleaned during its layover. It arrived from Lima, Peru, and probably the most jarring sight was that someone's used socks were still dumped behind the seat. But that aside, it was time to settle in and enjoy every moment of this flight to Orlando.
There are also four window exits over the wings. When open, ramp flights will automatically inflate. If needed, anticipation of the refreshment service, I brought out the tray table. These tables are rigid and can be used folded or fully opened. There's also a small device holder at the end in case you want to prop up your iPad or phone. The headphones for the in-flight entertainment weren't exactly noise cancelling, but I, I didn't really care, the sound quality was good enough. The next item on the agenda was to explore the in-flight entertainment system. First off, the screen is the main control point for the overhead panel, including the call button and reading light. I also really appreciate the IFE having a timeline of the flight. It's a short one today, so there's not much to expect. United's in-flight entertainment system is among the best in the US and, dare I say, the world. The system is very neat, organized, and has no shortage of content. The moving map is one of my favorite parts, primarily because of how detailed it is. Now, a trademark feature on United is the ability to listen to the communications between ATC and the pilots, although every time I fly United, I always forget to turn this on. Another cool feature of United's IFE is the sleep station that allows you to choose some sort of audio or visual option to relax to. Overall, it's a solid IFE that would surely keep you entertained on any flight. In-flight Wi-Fi is also available, which includes free messaging, games, streaming entertainment, and internet access for a fee, though I of course never bothered to use this.
extent of refreshment service on this flight was a snack basket that the crew came through with, and I decided to go with the pretzels, which were actually quite good. Unfortunately, United decreased the meal service threshold from flights of at least 800 miles to at least 900 miles. This flight is 850 miles, so it barely misses the threshold. Unfortunately, that means we only get snacks today. Still, the crew was constantly coming through the cabin offering refill options for various drinks. I first had water served in a proper glass this time, and then later opted for a zero sugar coke. Now, because the flight was so short, I never got the chance to recline the seat into its fully flat position. But for no reason at all, here's a demo of me turning the lamp on. I soon visited one of the forward lavatories. In terms of amenities, you will of course find a coat hook in addition to various fancy sprays and lotions. Now, the last thing I wanted to highlight about these Polaris seats is just how private they feel despite not having features like an actual sliding door. The seats are quite literally designed such that you have to make an effort to try and see other passengers. Otherwise, at least in my case, you can't see anyone from the angle at which you sit, and that makes the experience just feel so much more private. But soon enough, the seatbelt sign came back on as we had just about crossed the Gulf of Mexico and neared the Floridian coast, signaling our descent was imminent. Orlando, being the high-demand leisure destination that it is, sees a wide variety of North American wide bodies flying there. When I took this flight, United was also flying 777-200s there from both Houston and Chicago. After entering Floridian territory over Tampa, our descent brought us over Lakeland and other areas of central Florida before turning base over Poinciana and Lake Tohopecaliga and coming into land on runway 36 left.
So if you've been following the videos lately, you'll note that I had purchased a multi-city ticket on United from Chicago to Dallas to Orlando for $300. I ended up paying just $7 for the ticket because I had $293 worth of credit from previously canceled trips. However, it's worth noting that I was initially booked in economy class on this flight and shortly after booking my ticket, paid extra to upgrade to first class because how often do you get to fly a United 767 domestically anyway? The upgrade price was $139, which I was fine with considering United charges right around that much to upgrade to economy plus on some flights. Yeah, trust me, I've seen that and it's ridiculous. The main point of this flight was just to fly the 767-300, and being up front in Polaris made the experience all the more memorable. Yes, the lack of a proper meal service was disappointing, but still the crew was very attentive and provided efficient service. There's not much else to really say other than I think it was a great flight. And with that, welcome to Orlando, where I'd essentially spend most of the day in the United Club before taking a massive L and flying Spirit Airlines back home. Stay tuned for those videos coming out very soon. Anyways, thanks a lot for watching today and I hope you enjoyed the video. Until I see you next time, stay safe, take care, and goodbye.